Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I will tell you a little bit about uh, real production experience with uh, Scala.js, uh, in particular with uh, big uh, web applications. So, uh, before we start, a little bit about me. I'm Scala developer at Evolution Gaming. My name is Vladimir Pavkin, and uh, uh, my software career started in 2012. I was uh, doing JavaScript these days, and in 2014 I switched to Scala, and uh, recently after that I started hacking Scala.js. So uh, this talk is uh, both about Scala and JavaScript, and uh, I believe I've seen both worlds from a professional developer standpoint. Uh, so uh, ag agenda for uh, this talk, brief introduction to Scala.js. Uh, it's not going to be a tutorial, just an introduction so that unfamiliar people get on track of what's going on. Uh, then a small section about how we use it in uh, Evolution Gaming. Uh, there will be just some different uh, interesting numbers and statistics. Uh, then the main section is uh, our real experience, uh, examples, pros and cons uh, of uh, Scala.js and a uh, uh, small conclusion in the end. So. Before we start, I would like to ask how many of you tried or used JavaScript in your work? Okay, almost everyone. Who would have known? Okay, uh, uh, the same question about Scala. How many of you tried or used Scala? Okay, great, almost a, almost a half. And how many of you heard about Scala.js? That, that's good. So hope, uh, anyway, hope I will bring in some light, uh, some new things to you today. So uh, when uh, some, uh, when some Java guy, uh, fellow Java guy hears about Scala.js, uh, the first question I hear is, is it some new GWT or, or what? And uh, this is why the first thing I'm going to tell is not uh, what Scala.js is, but what, what Scala.js is not. And uh, Scala.js is definitely not a new web framework like Angular, uh, GWT or something like that. It doesn't make any design decisions for you, design, any design choices for you. It allows you full freedom in your uh, architecture. And uh, the second is that it, it is not a new language. Basically, it's just the same Scala. No new language features are introduced. It's uh, the same old Scala. And to put it shortly, it is, Scala.js is just a transpiler from Scala to JavaScript. Uh, how many of you know what a transpiler is? Okay, okay, fair amount. So, Another word for this is source to source compiler and to just the better, the best explanation to me uh, like what Scala.js is is to compare it with the modern front end development workflow. So uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, modern uh, JavaScript developer writes some code in the modern, modern flavor of uh, JavaScript probably with some TypeScript additions. Uh, the important thing is that it cannot be run in the browser, browser directly. The browser doesn't understand this code. So what, what the guys do, they run it through a transpiler. It can be Babel, uh, Webpack, or uh, that same TypeScript compiler. The thing is that in the end you get same old raw JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript 3 compatible JavaScript probably that can be run in any modern browser. Let's take a look at uh, Scala.js workflow. We run, uh, we write uh, the same browser incompatible code, it's just different language, it is Scala. We run it through Scala.js uh, transpiler and we get, again, that same like, uh, assembler of the web as it is called, the JavaScript. Uh, a little addition here is that this stage is uh, actually consists of three uh, internal stages. It is, the first thing you need to do is to compile Scala code into intermediate representation. And then uh, the second stage is uh, Scala.js optimizer, which uh, does a really awesome job of preparing uh, this intermediate representation to be run efficiently in the browser. And uh, the last one is emission, is uh, comparing this, uh, converting this intermediate representation into JavaScript. Now I will answer some primary questions that newcomers will probably ask about this uh, new technology. Um, Scala.js is statically typed, of course. It supports 100% of Scala language, uh, almost entire st standard library uh, of the Scala, and uh, you get 
uh, really one of the most powerful type systems in the world uh, in the browser. You can definitely do everything you can do in native JavaScript. So all standard ECMAScript APIs are supported. You can work with DOM. You can uh, use date, browser date utilities and stuff like that. Uh, you can write even dy dynamic code with, which will map directly into JavaScript. Uh, another question, do you really need it? Uh, why would you choose ColorJS in the first place if you want to, run, uh, to write dynamic code? And you will probably use existing JavaScript libraries. Uh, in interoperation with JavaScript is very good, so uh, there is uh, no obstacles in using native uh, React.js. And these days, this is the way to go for uh, to run, to write uh, front-end in ScalaJS. Uh, is it production ready? Uh, I would say, and I believe it definitely is. Uh, version 1.0.0 is coming out this year, hopefully. Uh, but uh, this will be mostly API cleanup and uh, preparation for uh, a long-lived major version that won't have any further uh, breaking changes. So uh, 0 6, uh, 16, the current version, is production ready. And this is provided by, for example, good performance, which is benchmarked, of course. Uh, most of the times, uh, ScalaJS code runs uh, at the same speed as native JavaScript, sometimes Quite slower, but this is real. Small runtime size, uh, Hello World will uh, have weight of 100 kilobytes. This is still much more than uh, native JavaScript Hello World, but uh, for a compiled uh, language, this is quite nice uh, result. And uh, it is supported by, uh, supported by most of uh, Scala libraries in the ecosystem. Even uh, such a thing like Eka is ported to JavaScript, so you can, for example, build actor systems in your browser easily these days. A little, I'll tell a little bit now about how we use it in, in our company. Uh, we have lots of uh, Scala development and Scala project in general, but uh, last year we decided to experiment to try ScalaJS into our internal projects. They are written entirely, uh, front end uh, written, uh, is written entirely in ScalaJS. Uh, one is a big uh, employee scheduling applications. Application, we have lots of uh, employees who are need to be, need to be scheduled, and uh, this, uh, so this is a rather complex application. And another one is uh, a web application. This is quite a recent experiment, so I'll, I'll be telling about the first one today. And we plan uh, to do a lot of, uh, not, not maybe a lot, but we, we plan to use ScalaJS in the future because uh, results turn out to be quite good result of our experiment. Uh, so uh, the showcase for today is a single page application uh, written in uh, React. Um, it uh, operates, it manages uh, several thousands of uh, employees and it has a really complex and heavy UI, uh, which uh, all of this sounds a, a real challenge for front-end technology. I'll briefly show some screenshots. This is our scheduling UI on the test environment. So uh, uh, we use uh, Bootstrap for styling, and uh, as it is internal, we don't uh, really spend a lot of time on the UX, but it, it, uh, uh, it is convenient, uh, though probably a little bit overwhelming. But uh, this probably shows that there is nothing uh, impossible for ScalaJS comparing to native JS. You can do everything you can in JavaScript without any design restrictions. So the stack is uh, ScalaJS React, which is uh, bindings ScalaJS um, for native ReactJS. This is one of the core libraries actually in the ecosystem because it opened, for, for many people, it opened doors to using production, using ScalaJS in production. Uh, the author is uh, David Berry. He does, does a really amazing job on this library. Uh, uh, the diode is uh, Redux-like state management. It uh, really looks uh, much closer to Elm than to pure Redux. And um, it is much more powerful than Redux uh, due to a uh, rich type system of Scala. Uh, Scala CSS, uh, nothing much to say about it, just a type save DSL for CSS. Rather nice, but nothing really fancy. And uh, 
we use uh, native JavaScript libraries uh, Bootstrap with uh, a little bit of jQuery because it requires it, and use Moment.js for dates on the front end, and also some general oriented libraries. As I said, all most uh, most of popular libraries are supported uh, are supporting Scala.js. And some random facts: we have uh, more than thousands of uh, Scala files. Uh, this is both front end and back end. And we have almost zero uh, JavaScript code. Um, production uh, file size is around uh, three megabytes plus one megabyte uh, raw JavaScript dependencies, for example, React.js and other libraries. Uh, compile time for the whole project is four and a half minutes. Uh, front end itself would take around one or two minutes. Uh, and uh, as I already said, there is a separate optimization stage. Uh, we do this only on uh, continuous integration. We don't do it uh, during development, but it takes another two and a half minutes. And the, the hot reload, uh, it is in, bra in brackets because it's not real hot reload as we uh, get, as we used to in React. Um, it takes around, so while we develop front end, the hot reload takes around 10, 15 seconds. I'll tell a bit uh, about it uh, later. So the main section, our experience. Mm, uh, what results and ideas we can share after a year of uh, working with colleges in production? Uh, I'll start with hard things. Uh, this is probably the best word I could have come up with for this section because uh, many of the points here are not really the advantages, uh, are not bad. They're just thing you might may not expect uh, at first and you just have to get used to along the way. So, uh, first thing is that you have to know both uh, JavaScript and Scala uh, to some extent to really get uh, the leverage, get leverage uh, the, of the Scala.js power. It's just a transpiler, so all the design choices uh, are up to you. And you will have to know how front-end works in general if you want to uh, write a front-end application. Um, you have to be aware of some current best practices and trends. For example, it's how single page applications should be structured, how React or Redux work. Uh, you have to have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript. Uh, so everything that is related to web development, you, you can't miss it. You have to be aware of that. And of course, you have to know Scala. Uh, this is probably the, the key factor here. Uh, and overall, this is quite a big list of things to know. Uh, and uh, the world food, full stack uh, can uh, come in mind here, and this is partially true, but uh, luckily there is a relief. Uh, you are guarded from all the tricky stuff, uh, from most of the tricky stuff in JavaScript. Um, there are several things JavaScript is hated for. For example, this uh, the meaning of this keyword. And, uh, uh, but as I said, um, you you won't have to deal with the native JavaScript uh, probably at all. This is the problems of uh, library designers or uh, uh, a little bit of uh, this trickery you will have to face if you use some native libraries through the case. But most of the time, uh, you can just forget about this. So this is a nice part. Output file size is another uh, problem. Um, so runtime is quite small, so 100 kilobytes uh, are not really uh, fearful, but um, really joyful development comes with uh, libraries, and uh, libraries add up. Optimizer also does some inlining to, so that your code, uh, code runs uh, really fast, and this also uh, enlarges the file. And uh, this is not a big problem for desktop apps. Uh, Nobody is uh, afraid of like several megabytes on desktop, but for mobile, this can be another question. Uh, optimization, optimizer slowdown. So this is uh, a little bit tricky. I won't spend uh, too much on this, but um, most of the time, optimizer works uh, really well. It does a, a really awesome job on performance, as I already said, but uh, specific rare cases can make optimizer do really insane things, and uh, once we got a uh, just tenfold slowdown uh, because of adding one flat map. So 
uh, if somebody is interested in details, I share the link and I can tell uh, after the talk about the details. But basically, Optimizer was lining the same code uh, like several hundred times and that bunch of code was uh, quite big. So output file increased tenfold and the optimization time increased tenfold. Um, but uh, the case was uh, fixed uh, really quick. The community is really responsive and uh, very welcoming. So this was not a problem. I just uh, contacted the maintainers on Gitter and everything was resolved quite quickly. Uh, reload is not so hot. This is probably one of the problems that is really n not solvable uh, to some extent because uh, probably uh, many of you know about this React hot reload feature and fortunately uh, ScalaJS, the way how ScalaJS works, uh, just natural in inherent limitations for providing the same experience with ScalaJS. There are some solutions, for example, Play Framework has uh, this uh, live reload feature uh, and uh, it helps with front end development. Uh, there is also experimental hot reload at the Li Howie Workbench project, but uh, still it's um, uh, rather limited, uh, provides rather limited experience comparing to React. So this is a trade off. Uh, unexpected semantic, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so who can tell me what should be printed out here by this small snippet? So, any guesses? Okay, so the output is this. And uh, uh, when I first uh, faced uh, this problem, I just ran to GitHub posting an issue. What the hell? Why do you have these bugs? And, and you're claiming you're production ready. But actually, uh, if you take uh, JavaScript runtime and JVM runtime, there are lots of differences. And guys did an amazing job uh, adap of adapting all these differences. And uh, there is a whole small page in, on their site about the semantics of how colleges work. And there are several uh, these tricky things. Uh, there is nothing that will stop you from solving your problems in reality. So they are, they are not showstoppers. They are just uh, specific features of uh, how colleges work. You just need to be aware of them. This is not a big problem. Uh, coverage uh, is a very useful tool and for colleges there is still lots of work to be done. Um, coverage claims to support ScalaJS and it does for purely ScalaJS projects. But if you have some dynamic calls uh, that interact with JavaScript, um, you're in a problem because the code won't compile. There are uh, several issues uh, on the GitHub. I reference them here, so uh, there is a long, uh, still a long road to support this uh, in full strength. And probably the last. Uh, the problems uh, for today is uh, that IDE sometimes uh, gives up on the code. So uh, overall, IDE support is wonderful, and I will tell a, a little bit in the uh, second part of this section. But when project becomes big, some file just kill type checker for some reason. I don't know uh, why. Uh, in some cases, even highlighting dies, so you just get a white cone code on the black background or whatever. Uh, color theming you use, but this is really rare, but not to the extent where we can ignore it. So there, this is also a space to for improvement. But this this also won't stop you from solving the problem. Your problem. And that's it for the advantages, for bad things, for hard things. Uh, let's take a look at what ScalaJS uh, gives you, and. While the list of hard things is long and many of the problems can be significant, the good things are so massive and uh, empowering. So it, it, it is totally worth trying out, I believe. And the first thing on the list is, uh, of course, this code sharing. It is um, just insanely useful. I can't really stress it more. You can probably recall this uh, hype in JavaScript community when everybody was telling, uh, telling about it, isomorphic code or as it was also called universal code where you, are, uh, where you write just a single uh, piece of code and you run it both on the server, uh, at, on the Node.js and on the browser. So this is the same thing for Scala code. 
and uh, uh, I'll take a, a brief overview of what it uh, really gives. Uh, basically, it solves uh, lots of problems for free. Uh, you can share uh, for the main business logic, and this will give you various optimistic scenarios for free. You can uh, do some optimistic uh, optimistic uh, optimistic updates on your uh, front end. Uh, and you will be sure that it is done according to the business logic you've defined because it is the same code. It, it can be different. Uh, you can share API protocols and data transfer objects, for example, and you will get API synchronization for free. So until your uh, API is not synced, your project won't even compile because it is just the same code. Uh, and uh, there is no communication overhead on this uh, shared code development. Uh, but Things that usually take some communication that, uh, for example, is API development. JavaScript developers communicate, Scala developers, they decide on what, how the endpoint will look, uh, what the DTO format will be, so this is gone. And uh, even for platform-specific code, there is a way to abstract logic and write uh, shared universal code in terms of this logic. This is a little bit advanced, uh, but if, you interest, if you're interested, I can tell about it after the talk. I'll show a small example. So this is the share code. We define some uh, domain model. Uh, that, that basically, not the main model, data transfer object, yes. Uh, this can be a really nested tree structure. Here it is rather small, but in a real example in uh, our application, we use really deeply nested tree with various types, uh, list, maps, and uh, uh, so on. And these are encoders. Uh, this is uh, basically the tools for converting uh, these DTOs to JSON and backward. So some of them are, here I use a source library, some of them can be written by hand, uh, some of them can be derived automatically by the compiler from the structure. So this is all type safe, there is no reflection here. Uh, and source is really a great library, but that's not the topic, so let's see how we can use this. So this code, code was shared and it was compiled both to J JVM and to JavaScript platform. So on the backend, in the controller, we can use this DTO, grab it from somewhere of our services or from the database, and we can serve it as JSON. And this is a play action, play framework action. On the front end, we can, for example, send a AJAX, AJAX request uh, to some URL, and uh, so this will return a future, and we map this future, and we try to decode the response according to the data transfer object we defined. Uh, so this is a small snippet. So we use use it, uh, the uh, use the DTO and the codex uh, both on the back end and on the front end. So if we, for example, decide to change uh, something in our DTO, for example, add uh, a field to schedule. So at, after we do this, our uh, we need to change adjust our codex. Probably in this case we won't we won't need it because we have these automatically derived. They will be rederived, but uh, some other points in your application will stop uh, compiling, but after you uh, make it compile again, you adjust for this fix everywhere in your application, your API is synced again. So you will go here and this field will be taken in account both here and here. So your API is synchronized uh, always. And this is super useful. It removes lots of boilerplate and uh, word duplication. Uh, next one is ID and tooling. Uh, so everything that works for Scala in IntelliJ IDEA will work for your front-end development. You'll have all the complete code navigation, uh, re wonderful refactoring and uh, highlighting. So there are some examples. Uh, and you can also use this uh, feature of uh, dynamic uh, documentation in IntelliJ IDEA to explore some uh, DOM APIs or something like this. So this also works for native JavaScript APIs. Uh, and libraries through these uh, facades. And all these features are much more reliable than in any JavaScript IDE, and the problem is, of course, not in IDE, but in the language itself. So the static typing helps a lot to provide much more reliable experience with tools. And as I, again, as I said, no special plugin is required. It works with a regular Scala plugin for IntelliJ IDEA. A uh, small note about the markup, of course, is there are Lots of DSL, this is ScalaJS React DSL for a type safe markup. This also 
saves from uh, various typos, allows you to use uh, various uh, uh, Scala features like lambdas here, uh, in, right in your mar markup to make your code more readable. So, rich type system, this is, uh, this was also a game changer for me in the front end development. So all color features are supported here. You can use higher kind of types, uh, implicit macros, even color meta started to uh, work on Scala.js recently. Uh, and this gives maximum uh, power of uh, design thought to you. You can express yourself in the most rich way uh, you would like. So I'll show an example here. So. This is an example of our real experience that we had the same problem and I'll show how the solution evolved uh, along the way. So let's say we have this uh, drop down selector, this very regular component for the web. You need to, you can see it like for example for currency selection or you can really select various things, the employees, the payment methods, delivery methods. Um, and uh, this is a very common problem and we, uh, and the problem is you can have lots of various types of uh, things you want to select from. And of course you would like to have some generic code, abstract code that will support uh, this component for any type of element in the list. Uh, so we have this component here. This is initial approach where it really smells weird because uh, there are these strings. So this is the props, uh, properties of, com of the component, uh, selected element, uh, the on-change callback, so when new element is selected, we get this callback called with the string, and the list of all elements to render. And these are the, uh, this is the function that renders single element, so the implement implementation is uh, left blank here, it is not the scope of the example. And in render method, we just, uh, here we just render all of them one by one in the div, but for real a selector will have some more complex markup. Uh, so the problem here is that uh, it really smells JavaScript. It has no type safety, so we need to uh, cast our real elements to strings somehow to provide it to the selector. We need to cast back when we handle this on change callback, so we need to know what, re what element was really selected, uh, not some kind of string that was, that was clicked. So the problem is, of course, in these strings. So the first approach was, of course, to abstract over this type. Uh, so let's replace string with some parameter t, type parameter t. So this is already much nicer. So we can provide uh, a list of elements of arbitrary type, and it will be rendered uh, generically. But there are also some problems here. So how we render arbitrary t? This is the question. We don't really want to call uh, the two-string method, right? This is, this is not what color was designed for. Uh, we're not writing Java. So, um, this is one question. Uh, second question is to, it's kind of the same, uh, of the same nature, but how we get an uh, ID for element to add to the markups. So, we might need our Selenium tests to click exact element we want, and we need a way to extract this element from DOM. And we could make it work in several ways. For example, we could uh, override this render element in each component uh, to render the, uh, the T. But this would be a nice solution. But uh, purely functional approach is to use type classes, and type classes, of course, of course work uh, in ScalaJS. So here, things can become difficult, uh, probably, for people who are not really uh, familiar with, with the uh, Scala features, uh, but I will try to explain uh, the idea with, uh, with simple words so that everybody understands the point. So let's introduce some type classes that will define these new behaviors we need for some abstract type T. So, uh, type class named will just say that if there is an instance of this type class for type T, we can get a name for it of type string. And we'll have another type class identify that will say that for element of T we can get a unique identifier also of type string. Uh, I try to keep things simple here in signatures. 
but you can have, for example, some another type of this ID. So, and what we do here is the only thing is changed comparing to the last uh, slide is we add this context bound. So this is very cool. So let's uh, make a small recap. So we have this generic selector uh, which works for our arbitrary type T. We can render them and we can plug in this rendering behavior uh, into uh, like uh, polymorphically and we can also use identifiers. And this will save the typing. So this will save the types, pre uh, preserve the types. This will not lose the type. Um, somebody can tell here that but we are restricting our type T. Like we were working with generic type T, now it is it has some constraint. Uh, thing is we're not constraining the T, we are constraining the generic selector here. So if we are going to create it, uh, uh, we can we can really define it for any type T. But, but when we create the generic selector, we need instances of this named and the identified. But the type T itself is totally unconstrained. It can uh, be even taken from some another library. So it doesn't have to extend some class or trait. It doesn't have to do anything. It can be totally arbitrary. So uh, I'll show one more step of this evolution. This is really much more advanced, but I, I really would want to show that for developer who is really uh, interested in uh, in good code design and functional programming, there is no limit uh, on the front end as well. You can even discover uh, very cool things. So at some point we realized that we need a selector where the selection is optional. So you can just not select anything. And uh, here, with this selector, it's not possible because if we take a look at this signature, uh, the selection, the signature means that there always has to be one element selected. You can't uh, omit the selection. It is hard, uh, the meaning of being selected is hard coded here. It means that always one element should be selected. And how to make it for an optional selection? We didn't want to like uh, re-implement everything for optional selection uh, again, like to have separate component for optional selector. We wanted to have this abstract selector supporting optional selector. So, um, we'll abstract over the meaning of uh, what uh, we'll abstract of what it means to be selected. We'll make it abstract, and we'll make it with uh, higher kind of type F. So we'll wrap R T into F, and F will represent uh, what does it mean to be selected. So ignore these uh, constraints here, these are uh, not of the scope, but th these uh, will help in the rendering machinery. But let's just try to apply various effects. So th these uh, higher kind of types are some, sometimes called effects. So this is effect of uh, selection. Let's apply various effects here. So to get back our strict selector that always require one element selected, we'll just use the identity functor here. So identity functor just remove this layer of F and we get back our T's. So strict selector is uh, easily recoverable from this component. But let's see what happened if we replace this F with an option from Scala. There's just regular option. So our selected element will become an option of T. So we'll have uh, uh, a possibility to have none here, so, and this will represent the case of when no elements are selected. And the on change callback will also provide us with uh, the case where so, uh, some element, for example, was selected and then it, wa uh, it was deselected. So we'll have the none here. We can react on this change as well. And uh, so this really fits our requirements. And if we take a look of in the end, how it is created, uh, we can we can create it like this. So we can just say that strict currency selector is a generic selector of identity functor and the currency. Uh, optional currency selector is the same generic selector, but with selection effect equal option. And if we go further, we can even uh, just try to apply list as a selection effect. And this will actually mean uh, 
the multi uh, we provide a multi-select effect. You can have a list of elements selected, and you can react on the changes of this uh, list on, in the on change callback. So this is really wonderful. This is this gives so much power in uh, designing things, in designing software in the browser. And this is available today uh, in ScalaJS. Uh, there is no monkey patching, no dynamic casting, no nulls, undefined, or whatever stuff you can have in JavaScript. Uh, and this is really, really nice. You feel, you feel really wonderful when you can just express yourself with the full power. Next one. Uh, it kind of can sound funny or offensive, whatever, but I didn't want to uh, sound offensive, really. Uh, but uh, there are some cases where JavaScript developers, developers are really expensive, too expensive solution. For example, for some internal projects, uh, uh, admin systems, you really don't want to have a full-time dedicated JavaScript developer to support some internal front-end system. And now this work can be done without any dedicated front-end developer. And, um, in these cases, there are also a lot of advantages. Scala developers will, whole, will own the whole code base, and will, uh, various changes will be done much more, much simpler. And of course, if you want, uh, if you have a team of Scala developers that really want to write front end as well in Scala, you you really can just call call back your JavaScript positions. You can just revoke them because you don't need them. Actually, your Scala devs have everything uh, these days to do full stack development without resorting to ancient technologies. <laughs> so seamless interpretation. This is a, a very important feature because it allows uh, really using uh, JavaScript libraries uh, that are available. This is very important for UI framework because there is no Scala.js UI framework these days. We use, uh, uh, use React.js, we use Angular. Uh, and um, comparing to other technologies that are compiling to JavaScript, ScalaJS interop is uh, much, it's very simple, it's very nice. So I did a little research and uh, I could say that only pure script has the same level of expressiveness and simplicity in JavaScript interpretation. So you can, um, for example, if you have Elm, there is uh, much more trickery in interacting with uh, native JavaScript. Um, so highlights here is uh, just you can freely mix native JavaScript uh, call, calls and uh, your Scala.js calls and the code. You can even write your library, JavaScript library in Scala.js and provide it to some JS developers to develop their things. This can be particularly useful to some API providers that can just publish uh, their uh, API SDKs right from their backend code, from their backend DTOs. It will also provide this 100% uh, safe and automatic API synchronization. And again, this uh, interop is much more pleasure with IDE support. And the last one, but not the least, probably this Diode state management is uh, also a very, very big booster for your productivity on the front end. Um, so there is a pod monad which uh, uh, encapsulates various states of the front end, uh, uh, various states of the state in the front end. For example, when something, some content is loading, this is represented in a nice way, and it really shines in combination with Scala.js React. So we we are uh, this is not just a word; we are using it, and it gives lots of uh, uh, moves lots of pain away. So to wrap up, uh, our experience was really very nice. Although we faced uh, several obstacles uh, along the way, we've managed to accomplish our goal to build a big and complex web application with uh, Scala.js. So uh, this application has a very safe code because uh, of uh, Scala compiler help. It is uh, very well designed and easily scalable thanks to impressive power of type system uh, of Scala. It's flexible and easy to maintain uh, due to excellent IDE tools. And uh, it requires much less work on client-server communications and optimistic scenarios because of uh, uh, code sharing. So regular single-page application 
stuff uh, becomes requires much less work. So to make a conclusion, um, I started, as I already said, I started as a front-end developer. And I really loved it because there is uh, one thing in front-end development that uh, I miss uh, when I develop backends, and this is this thing is seeing how people use your work. So if you think people don't really send HTTP requests, right? They but they they press buttons, they scroll UIs. People are not amazed by the quality or design of your APIs, but they are amazed by some UI decisions or some full UX things. And seeing this brings lots of pleasure lots of additional pleasure in your work. And uh, when I switched to Scala, I, I was really missing that. And uh, to say more, I, was, I couldn't even write JavaScript anymore because the, its weakness uh, became so obvious, so I couldn't, I couldn't really touch it after uh, trying Scala. <laughs> and I couldn't express myself adequately in it. So uh, front-end was no joy anymore. This was even worse. So. But the Scala JS uh, is what brings the joy of front-end development back. So now I can uh, see how people uh, really uh, use my work, how it makes their life easier. And I don't have to struggle while doing it. I, I can uh, efficiently um, and safely express myself without any um, uh, monkey patching and dynamic code. I can do it with excitement and pleasure. And I know a lot of really smart JavaScript developers, uh, and in my opinion, like the, the community of JavaScript developers is uh, probably the greatest community, uh, IT community in the world. And in my opinion, it's a shame that these people have to uh, resort to some really strange tools, ancient tools like uh, JavaScript. And uh, I'm sure that by selecting some modern technology, at least for some tasks, uh, these developers can really unlock their full potential their in software development so they can really feel them as a top class uh, software engineers uh, these days. Uh, thank you. That was a big pleasure to share my experience with you. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We have time. Yes. Hello. Yeah, thank you for your speech. Mm -hmm. uh, we have time for questions. Anyway, questions? Uh, you said about uh, seamless interoperability with um, uh, JS. Uh, that was one of my advantages. Uh, but what about uh, inter interoperability with uh, TypeScript? Uh, for example, as far as I know, uh, Scala JS binding to Angular 2 is far from being fully functional, and not just because it isn't ready, but uh, um, because their compatibility is not as good as uh, we would want. Uh, probably, there, as I already said, there is a version 1.0.0 coming up and there are lots of uh, uh, features uh, will come in that will probably improve uh, support for interoperation. So there is still work to be done. Uh, I can't say really sure about this Angular 2 because I haven't use, used it, uh, but um, I don't think that interoperation with TypeScript is uh, some kind of deal because uh, in the end, your like TypeScript is gone when the JavaScript is compiled, so you basically don't know. TypeScript helps to automatically generate these facades for your Scala code. And this is where TypeScript helps, and the quality of these tools of generating Scala facades for TypeScript libraries is uh, still under like under development, so the quality is not top class. So this is a way to, uh, place to improve. But uh, feature-wise, ScalaJS will support everything that is needed for your library to work with ScalaJS seamlessly. When you debug in browser, you see Scala code or uh, JavaScript uh, compiled uh, code? There is, thanks, yeah, I understand the question. There is, uh, the source maps are generated, so you see Scala code. Okay. There are some small problems there. They are going to be fixed as well uh, and, uh, until this version 1.0.0, but most of the time you see Scala code. Okay. 
Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody? So you use the JSON for transport, but you use yes. also other forms for transport. Sure, I don't, I don't see why this can be a problem. No, there is nothing in CalJS that uh, forces you to use JSON. That, so you can use XML if you want, or even some binary stuff. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed like there was some uh, boilerplate in the client side, AJAX calls on the server side, uh, when you accept those calls and you kind of, could we generate those calls based on uh, some facade traits, shared facade traits between the client and the server using some macros or Scala meta or whatnot? You mean the uh, URLs of endpoints or what? Yeah, the URLs where you invoke the URLs where you convert yeah. them to some particular type uh, using Cirque. Yep. Why not? There is uh, even some project called AutoWire that uh, provides this synchronization or even of the endpoints of URLs. So if I understood the question correctly, there is nothing that stops you. And these days when Scala Meta compiles to uh, Java, Scala JS, uh, you can really do whatever you want. So if Scala doesn't support something, you can write a macro. Thank you. Maybe my question is a bit theoretical, but Scala.js, uh, is there any experience in running it with, uh, on the backend code? Uh, yes, uh, so if you want to have some fun, you can definitely run it on Node. So you can just, uh, so nothing stops you from doing that. I, another question is why? So it, maybe... I said it, that's theoretical. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there is even, there are even tickets for supporting file I.O. on Node.js for Scala, because like you can do file I.O. in browser, so uh, this part of a standard library is not supported by Scala.js, but there are issue, uh, tickets for supporting it for Node.js. Yeah, so work is done in this direction. I really would like to see why guys selecting the choice, but this is another question. And I also wanted to know, what was the primary driver to try Scala.js, was it? for code reuse or to minimize the zoo of stack uh, that you are using? Uh, um, you mean uh, the primary um, reason of uh, we, uh, us selecting yes, it? Yes, yes, exactly. Ah, okay, so uh, primary reason was uh, because I prior, priorly had this uh, experience I, and I, I was already knowing that this, this is it to write front end and we decided to experiment just to try it out. Uh, on the internal system. And uh, so we knew of all of these advantages uh, and uh, just, so I, I would say that everything, IDE, code sharing and uh, uh, all others, but I would say the three major uh, that in the end turned up to buy the most uh, advantages is code sharing, uh, tool, tools, IDE tools and uh, type system. 